This is a cartoon called John Brown Exhibiting His Hangman. It's from 1865, and it shows the abolitionist insurrectionist proudly displaying captured Confederate President Jefferson Davis in drag as a stereotypical group of black Americans dance beneath Davis's cage. Of course, back in 1859, Davis was a U.S. Senator from Mississippi and had nothing to do with the execution of Brown in Virginia for his raid on the Federal Armory in Harper's Ferry. But the propaganda war around Brown had been going on for several years before both the Civil War and his attack on Harper's Ferry. Both Northern and Southern zealots and the newspapers they read benefited from the mythologizing around Brown. But today I'd like to share some excerpts from the private diary of Edmund Ruffin, one of the so-called fire eaters, whose decades-long pursuit of secession had been mostly a lonely one until news of Brown's attack and arrest gave them renewed hope for their cause. Ruffin, a Virginia agriculturist and writer, made a point of traveling to Harper's Ferry to witness either Brown's hanging or whatever attempts he suspected might be made to rescue him. These diary entries span about six weeks, starting with the day Ruffin learned of the Harper's Ferry raid up through December 2nd, the day of Brown's execution. October 19th. The papers bring news of remarkable events for our usually quiet and calm population in Virginia. An insurrection occurred at Harper's Ferry on the night following last Sunday. The insurgents overawed the people of the village, compelled them to remain within their houses if not made prisoners, took forcible possession of the U.S. Armory and public property, killed and wounded some of the functionaries, stopped the railroad trains, cut the telegraph wires, and made prisoners, as if for hostages, of respectable neighbors on their farms several miles off. They were enlisting or forcing others, both white and black, into their ranks. All the actors are northerners and newcomers, even the few Negroes. And as incredible as it seemed at first naming by rumor, it really seems now most probable that the outbreak was planned and instigated by northern abolitionists and with the expectation of thus starting a general slave insurrection. I earnestly hope that such may be the truth of the case. Such a practical exercise of abolition principles is needed to stir the sluggish blood of the South. October 26th. The leader is John Brown, who had before gained notoriety as the leader of the brigands, murderers, and robbers kept in arms in Kansas by the Emigrant Aid Society of the North, whose object and effect were to put down slaveholding by force of arms and by murdering, if not expelling, the slaveholders. His murderous feats in Kansas he afterwards proclaimed in the northern states as a public lecturer. He is as thorough a fanatic as ever suffered martyrdom, and a very brave and able man, humble and obscure as has been all his life, except in his latter bloody operations in support of the abolition of slavery. With seven grown sons, he commenced his dangerous and bloody course in Kansas, of which the last remaining two were shot by his side at Harper's Ferry. It is impossible for me not to respect his thorough devotion to his bad cause and the undaunted courage with which he has sustained it through all losses and hazards. November 10th, looking over accumulated newspapers, Brown and some others of his companions have been tried and condemned to death. The most important of the very remarkable circumstances of this conspiracy and outbreak is the very general sympathy intimated for the criminals either directly or indirectly, through many of the northern states. The great mass of the people in the north, even embracing many who have been deemed most our friends, are more or less enemies of the south, as well as of Negro slavery, and do not entirely condemn the attempt to excite insurrection of the slaves with all the unspeakable atrocities and horrors which would attend even their partial success. Their complete success in establishing their freedom 
even with the aid of all our northern white brethren, is utterly impossible. But it is not impossible that renewed and extended attempts of this kind may produce a war of races to be terminated only in the extermination of the blacks and ruin with their victory to the whites. November 13th. Dr. Dupuy and Charles came, bringing the bad news of a great loss to the latter. Last night, before nine o'clock, fire was put to his stable, and that, with his only three mules were burnt, together with another building containing all his saved fodder. Neither Charles nor his overseer were at home, but all his negroes were. There is every appearance that they were guilty of the design burning, which is worse than the pecuniary loss by fire. This is the continuation of a dreadful state of things. This is the fifth house burning that has occurred to the properties of my different children, and four of them by design, within a few years. Yet in the 44 years in which I was head of a farm, there was not the slightest loss by house burning, neither accidental or other. November 18th. The mail brought telegraphic reports of sundry rumors and alarms about Harper's Ferry. It is astonishing even to me, and also very gratifying to me, that there should be so general an excitement and avowed sympathy among the people of the North for the late atrocious conspiracy and outbreak and for the villains engaged therein. If there are not serious and even effective efforts to rescue the condemned criminals, it will be for want of courage and not want of sympathy. And in the South, as well as the North, the excitement has been increasing and will be productive, I trust, of important results. We may now see that a great majority of the Northern people are so much the enemies of Negro slavery that they sympathize even with treason, murder, and every accompaniment of insurrection and with the worst criminals acting therein to overthrow slavery. The Northern friends of the South are so few or so timid that most of them remain silent or join in the general claim for mercy and pardon to Brown and his associates. This must open the eyes of the people of the South who have heretofore trusted to the justice and forbearance of the majority of the Northern people. And it will be evident to many who have most feared and abhorred disunion that that will be the only safeguard from the insane hostility of the North to Southern institutions and interests. December 1st. The governor has issued a proclamation recommending everybody to stay at home, and it is understood that none except the military and others in some official position will be allowed to come near the execution. To obtain the means of being near, and also of aiding if any military action should be by possibility needed, I have obtained the leave and aid of Colonel Smith, commanding the cadets of the Military Institute, for me to join, for tomorrow, that admirable corps. I shall occupy the somewhat ludicrous position of being the youngest member or recruit of this company of boyish soldiers. I received today, on loan, the arms and the uniform overcoat of a private for my use tomorrow. I wrote yesterday a label for the pike which I am to have of the number captured from Brown, and today I pasted a copy in large letters on the handle of one in possession of Mr. Hawks, thus, sample of the favors designed for us by our northern brethren. The pike, so labeled, was exhibited and attracted much attention. I hope that it will produce some effect. The people hereabout are much more unionists than in Lower Virginia. I use every suitable occasion to express my disunion sentiments. Sometimes they are approved, but more generally disapproved. December 2nd. Went in my borrowed uniform, overcoat, and arms of the Virginia Military Institute to join the Corps of Cadets for the day, and so to witness the execution of Brown. When I made my appearance, I could see what was very natural and excusable, that my position was very amusing and perhaps ludicrous to the young men, and it required all the constraint of their good manners to hide their merriment. After 11, Brown was brought 
in a light and open wagon sitting on his coffin and with the sheriff, jailer, and another assistant. As Brown came near to the gallows, I recognized him by his likeness to the published portraits. His arms were closely pinioned at the elbows by a cord crossing his back. As he passed by the gallows, he looked at it intently. Nothing was said by the criminal or on the scaffold except in such low tones that the high wind blowing from our line prevented our hearing a word. He went through what was required of him apparently with as little agitation as if he had been the willing assistant instead of the victim. A large hood of white linen was placed over his head through an aperture in which the halter passed. The criminal stood erect and must then have expected every moment to be his last. But all the troops which had formed his escort had not yet reached their assigned positions and halted there, and waiting for this, the signal was still delayed. This delay seemed to me full five minutes or longer, during which all time Brown stood erect and as motionless as if he had been a statue. Not the smallest movement or shifting of position was visible to me, and no shrinking or failing of the body to the mind because of the long continuance of this awful state of suspense. This, as it seemed to me, cruel and most trying infliction was not intended, for in every respect his treatment had been very indulgent and kind, notwithstanding his atrocious crimes and worse intentions. At last, however, the signal was given and the sheriff left the platform and it instantly dropped, leaving the criminal suspended by the halter. The fall was not more than 12 or 15 inches. I could not perceive the least movement of the body or limbs for about a minute of time after the fall. The villain whose life has thus been forfeited possessed but one virtue, if it should so be called, or one quality that is more highly esteemed by the world than the most rare and perfect virtues. This is physical or animal courage, or the most complete fearlessness of and insensibility to danger and death. In this quality, he seems to me to have had few equals. The fatigue of the forenoon and my loss of sleep last night made me very tired and sleepy in the afternoon. After writing the foregoing notes of the day, I shall go to bed earlier than usual. Two things stand out to me about these passages. First, that Edmund Ruffin clearly had a certain amount of respect for John Brown's fanaticism, which he could relate to, although coming from the opposite side of the ideological spectrum. Second, we hear Ruffin repeatedly hoping for worst-case scenarios that would, as he put it, awaken the South from its slumber. It reminds me of a meme a friend sent me while I was working on this episode, showing a bunch of people in a subway car all thinking the same thought. I can't wait for society to collapse so my ideology can rise triumphant from the ashes. Ruffin and other fire eaters had a few more bumps in the road to navigate before realizing their goal, but there's no doubt that the hype around the John Brown raid was a pivotal flashpoint in the culture wars preceding the Civil War. Those culture wars will be a major theme of this channel, and I hope you'll subscribe, comment on what struck you about Ruffin's diary entries, hit the like button, and share this video with anyone who might be interested. And if you'd like to learn more about Ruffin and his eventual fate, click the link in the description to my website where you'll find more of his story and links to my sources. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you in the next episode.